Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Welcome to Lunch with Books. And uh, if you would, please, if you have a cell phone and it makes a noise, would you silence it or put it on vibrate or whatever you kids do? If you're not on our email list but would like to be, put, uh, there's forms on that table over there. Uh, just put it in the box. Next Tuesday at noon, February 22, we will be holding the third annual Ann Thomas Memorial Lecture in this room at noon. And uh, Dr. William H. Turner, who's written a book called The Harlan Renaissance, which is about uh, black life in coal mining towns uh, from WVU Press, very well received book. He will be here next week. And uh, this Thursday, People's University Fairy Tales for Grown Ups starts. We're going to have hot chocolate and cookies, storyteller, music. It's going to be a lot of fun, but the stories are adult love. That's all I'm going to say. Uh, okay. So a while back, speaking of Ann Thomas, uh, Scott Thomas, our son who's here with us today, came to me with this idea that we should invite the first African-American graduates of Lindsay School to do a program. And uh, hey, I said, anytime someone gives me an idea and they're willing to do most of the work, <laughs> sounds good. Uh, it sounded like a great program. And so we have with us today several graduates, including Scott, who will speak to you later. But our first speaker is the first graduate. His name is Stephen Wright, Reverend Stephen Wright. He attended Lindsley from 68 to 72, worked as a steel worker. If I have any of this wrong, it's somebody else's fault. With, with Wheeling Pittsburgh Steel from 1973 to 85. Uh, in 69, he was elected the first vice president of West Virginia Baptist State Youth Convention. He has a BA from Washington Baptist Seminary. And since December 98, has been pastor at First Baptist Church of College Park one of the oldest African-American congregations in Maryland. And here he is, Reverend Steve Wright. Hold on, everybody, before he comes up, I have to provide some historical context before he comes up and does his thing. So again, I'm Scott Thomas. I uh, came to Sean with this idea to uh, recognize Mr. Reverend Wright as the first uh, black graduate from Lindsley Military Institute, not the current day prep school. Uh, so first of all, uh, Lindsley was established in uh, 1814 by Noah Lindsley. Uh, at that time, it was the state of Virginia. So the school was chartered by the state of Virginia. And then uh, in 1870, and it was named Lancastrian Academy. And then in 1877, that's when it became Lindsley Military Institute. They actually adopted the, um, the military aspect and the discipline aspect, I believe in 1861, if I'm not mistaken. So uh, Lindsley Military Institute existed from 1877 until 1978. Within that time frame, only 14 African-Americans attended Lindsley and only four graduated from Lindsley Military Institute before it transitioned to uh, Lindsley School, which is now the preparatory school. And Lindsley is recognized as the oldest preparatory school west of the Alleghenies. So 208 years as of this year, Lindsley has existed. So uh, I love history. I wanted to do something to help Sean out because he's just First of all, let's just give him and his staff a big round of applause. Uh, their lecture series is phenomenal. Uh, my mother was a recipient, I think three or four, well, she passed in 2019, so maybe a couple years before that. And I've come back to honor her uh, on one occasion. I can't remember who the speaker is. I won't be able to be here next uh, 22nd, but I'll try to zoom in and uh, say a few words. But uh, Without further ado, Reverend Stephen Wright. Thank you. 
Well, good afternoon. Good afternoon. And um, wow, um, I have stood over this last 50 years in some venues and preached in front of thousands. Um, but uh, I'm a little nervous today. Um, and I'm also humbled. I'm, I'm deeply humbled. You can just permit me before I go into the few uh, remarks that, uh, or, or, or a brief history of uh, being the, proudly being the first, I like to say, uh, black person to graduate from Lindsley when it was the Lindsley Military Institute. And the reason I make that designation the first black person uh, is because, you know, one can be born in Africa and have uh, another skin color other than mine come to America and obtain citizenship and be an African-American. So I am the first black person to graduate from Lindsley and what was then the Lindsley Military Institute. I'm so happy to see my sister here, uh, some members of my family, um, I always thought of my sister, my mother, and my father um, as I matriculated at Lindsley. So it's good to see you. It's good to see you. My niece is here, one of my nieces. Um, sometimes, and, and I hope you all catch what I'm saying here, with all that's going on in our nation today regarding race relations, you have to want to heal in order to heal. Uh, Mr. Justin Zimmerman is here. He is the head of school at Lensley. <clears throat> Lee, I see you, uh, chief uh, compliance officer or, or chief advancement officer. Um, Mr. Rennie Diorio, who is a former head of school, Lindsley, my good friend uh, who I grew up with and we grew up together. He's now a trustee at Lindsley, uh, Mr. William Gummer. I just know him as Bill. And I'm delighted to see in the back of the room some of the current students, the current students at Lindsley School. I'm going to ask that the current students at Lindsley School, would you please stand up? Thank you. You may be seated. And I'm going to try my best not to be become emotional here. But every person I would hope wants to live and see the fruits of their labor. You are, in particular, you are some of the fruits of my labor from way back 50 years ago. Um, again, to the officials from Lindsley who are here, thank you for providing the luncheon for uh, my wife and myself yesterday. Uh, my wife, I want you to meet her. Linda, will you please stand? She's been by my side uh, for a long time. I'm not going to tell you how long. <laughs> Say three grown children and two grandchildren, and one of those is grown. Um, she's been by my, by my side all of that time. But the uh, officials at Lindsley gave me a chance to, we, we understood each other yesterday, and that's my point. One of the points that I was making here is that if we want to heal, we have to, if we're going to heal, we have to want to heal. And, uh, it was a beautiful exchange between us yesterday um, that allowed me to heal and to really say that Lindsley is my alma mater. Um, yes, I have my diploma, but I never felt that Lindsley was my alma mater until yesterday. <clears throat> For that, I thank you all. And I hope that you don't feel put on that I say that this, but 
I've learned to speak truth to power. I got that at Lindsley. I got some of that at Lindsley, learning to speak truth to power. And I have had to do it on any of a number of levels, especially in the ministry. Um, Scott, these two brothers here, where, where did Scott go? He's sitting back there. I just met him, found out we just live a few miles from each other, just met him. <laughs> and uh, we have become fast friends. I thank you for, I hope I, I can thank you after this is all over, <laughs> <laughs> but for making this possible. Um, I thank you. Jeff Potts, we have become real fast friends. Uh, I owe him a phone call from this weekend, but things got so busy, so we're going to be talking too, but we have become real fast friends. And, um, he's in the ministry too, and that's one of the things that has drawn us together. Lindsley, you will never understand without my setting backdrop. My name is Stephen Lee Wright. I was born November 11, 1953 in Washington, D.C. Uh, at Freeman's Hospital. And back in 1953, every black person born in Washington, D.C. was born at Freeman's Hospital because that's the only place we could go. Um, I am the son of the late Reverend Lee and Mrs. Gracie Thomas Wright, for whom I owe everything, and to whom I owe everything for my upbringing, for my moral grounding, and for my spirit of perseverance. I have been a Christian ever since I was a little boy. And I bring that up, I don't knock anyone else's faith, but I bring that up because in my faith, we're taught to humble ourselves. And that if we do so in due season, God will exalt us. And so here I stand before you today, not looking for this, but standing before you today in what I consider an exalted position. So let's set the backdrop to my being at Lindsley. Again, you have to understand the times. It was 1968. Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King had been murdered in the spring of that year. There was trouble in the streets of Wheeling, West Virginia. I was sharing at the luncheon yesterday how a few of those nights were some of the scariest in my life. Because back then, the city of Wheeling had the will to police us in East Wheeling. But make no mistake about it, wheeling was not wide open for us. <clears throat> and so after King was shot, there was unrest in the streets in wheeling. My father was called down there to try to quell the trouble <clears throat> because they were afraid, the officials were afraid that the city would literally be burned to the ground. We were that fed up. We were that tired of having what we now know is a shoe or a knee on our necks. Back in that day, Black Panthers and the Black Nationalists <coughs> were marching in the streets with loaded weapons on their shoulders. They were giants too. We are not, for those of you who wonder, we are not a monolithic people. We are diverse in our thinking. So we were to the point that you can either do it peacefully or we can go the other route. 
and it would be all right with us. I was growing up on 13th Street. In fact, the house number was 67 13th Street. You need to understand that back then there were giants in the community who were involved in the civil rights movement. I lived right across the street from the late Thelma Griffin was very instrumental in civil rights and the promotion of civil rights here in Wheeling. In fact, the family that I'm married into, the family of Shirley Page, she had been arrested because, you know, we all look alike. So they thought she was Angela Davis. <laughs> There is actually, there is actually, it should be in the archives of the intelligence, a picture of her coming out of the city building. She had been handcuffed with her big afro, and she had an even bigger mouth and an even bigger heart and an even bigger mind, and she just wasn't going to quit pushing for racial justice. So she did. Right across the street from me, too, on 13th Street was the Kenny family, who I, I don't know if you've ever had Reverend John, Reverend Dr. John Kenny here. Yes. I hope so, because he is a, an intellectual giant. He used to throw the football to us. We pass the football back and forth in the street there on 13th Street. So there were a lot of positive black influences in my life, but it was a hot summer in Wheeling in 1968. And during that summer one day, my father approached me and he asked me a simple question. Would you like to go to Lindsley? Now I want you to notice he didn't say, you're going to Lindsley. But he asked me, would you like to go to Lindsley? And then he told me, he, he, he said, don't answer right now. He said, take some time to think about it. And I had been told by some of my friends when I was growing up that, uh, at that age that I was very serious. It seemed to be very serious. Now, don't get it twisted. I was a class clown in school. Don't mind telling you, I was at Clay School. <laughs> I was, I was, I was a class clown. My education had started in the uh, public school system of the District of Columbia. I attended J.C. Knoll Elementary School, Southeast Washington, and still stands today. It's still educating. It's still an elementary school. And when my father was called to pastor the Macedonia Baptist Church here in Wheeling. Our family relocated, and so my education continued at Clay School. Um, and when I uh, reached the eighth grade, I lost the Stifle Award for Academic Achievement by a matter of tenths of a point to another one of my good friends who I stay in contact with today. We're in contact with each other today, but she's done very well herself. And so that summer when my father asked me, do you want to go to Lindsley? My perception, I can't speak for the community's perception of Lindsley, but I know what mine, mine, my perception of mine is. Rich white guys go to Lindsley. I was not rich. <laughs> Still not rich. <laughs> Uh, and I certainly was not white. And I knew no white, no, no black person had ever, ever attended the Lindsley, what was then the Lindsley Military Institute. Yes, I thought about what I would be leaving behind to go to Lindsley. I left behind, most importantly, my first love was basketball. I left behind years of contending for a 
triple a triple a state championship at Wheeling High playing ball with my best friend who was a street Smith All-American Rick Coles you don't know he honed his skills against me in the heat at the Elks playground sometimes a hundred degrees in the middle of the day we were playing ball against each other I, and 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 I gave all that up. I gave up playing with my friends, the Galloways, the Gillespie's, Donnie Stevenson, all those guys. Um, it's like, I thought about that. It took me one night to think about that. But what I could not shake was this. Somebody's got to do it. So I'm going to Lindsay. I intend when I go to make it. I don't know exactly what all I'm getting into, but when I go, I'm not going to quit. I'm going to make it because if and when I make it, you saw them stand. That's what I was looking for. That's what I was trying to do. And I found myself caught between two realities. The community that I was growing up in and that I loved seemed to think, many of them, that I was trying to be better than them because I went to Lindsay. That's a reality. And I found myself wondering, well, why can't they see what I'm trying to do. The other reality was Lindsley itself. Um, my freshman year, I had to get used to a whole new culture, to being in an environment where I was riding the bus, public transportation every single day to and from Lindsley. And by the way, it protected my sanity to come back home every day, to come back into that very community where I was growing up. I'm so thankful to God that for those four years, yes, I rode the bus back and forward every single day to be around my people. Because it was so different at Lindsley. I didn't have the study habits that they had. You can imagine. Didn't have the money that they had. I used to see their parents come up, come up and pick up their children, fancy cars, all that kind of thing. And I came in contact with they told me yesterday at the luncheon, by the way, no, basically don't bite your tongue, just tell it like it is, which is what I was going to do anyway. <laughs> I found myself involved uh, or, or experiencing a kind of racism that I, you know, I, I encourage everybody to pick up the book by Hannah Nicole Jones that everybody's arguing about right now, the 1619 Project. She didn't. She didn't, it, it wasn't long before she nailed me. It was like, oh, yes, I know what you're talking about. Um, and it, there is a racism that our people experienced when the Great Migration took place from the South to the North. They got out of the Jim Crow of the South, the overt, open, in your face Jim Crow of the South and they moved north in search of jobs. More importantly, hoping to get away from Jim Crow. And so when we arrived north back then, we met the shock of that type of racism that smiles in your face. We'll shake your hand, but when you turn around and walk away, it's the same as when you were down south in the overt Jim Crow. That's what I ran into at Lindsay. Not everyone, 
Because I will tell you now that Lindsley is one of the best things that ever happened to me. It is one of the best things that ever happened to me those four years at the Lindsley Military Institute. But I endured the rubbing of the hair. It was a fascination with the texture. I see it's falling out. <laughs> but if I worked real hard at it back then, I could grow an afro. So I had a semi-afro. It would rub my hair, fascinated. It hurt. But I let that slide off my back. I stayed focused on why I was there. And there is often the only thing that it seemed like it was. I was there. I was not seen. As if what I was doing was fulfilling a quota. Because, you know, quotas became big things back then. Mm -hmm. And so... I don't care that you're here from the standpoint of you as a person and your personal development. That's on me. But you do help us to say we have a black person here. So for one full year, I was by myself. And then Bill came. The next year, I was so glad Bill came. <laughs> He came the next year. I knew he was going to make it, but I had to, one of us was going to make it. And I, my intention was, I'm going to make it. But that was the environment that I went into. And you all need to understand that that was tough. By the way, there is a group of people that I failed to acknowledge. They're with us on Zoom right now. And it is members of the church that I passed during College Park, Maryland. I know there are probably quite a few of them. Hello, you all. Um, <laughs> uh, they, they know me. They said, well, we know you're not going to bite your tongues. Uh, in fact, it is a historic, again, a historic congregation. It is known as the Historic First Baptist Church of Lakeland. That is our original name. I'm glad you all are with me today. Um, back to Lindsay. Um, I learned how to be around people who were in the upper echelons of the socioeconomic uh, strata. I needed to do that. I needed to be balanced. I needed to be able to say I can live with anybody as well as I can endure anything. So again, the racism that I experienced at Lindsley back then only became overt a couple of times, a few times. But if you're the one who's the victim of racism, you can feel it. You can sense it. You know it in how you're spoken to. You know it in how uh, uh, the actions and reactions of uh, an oppress, oppressor's mindset toward the oppressed. And I was certainly in the oppressed group. Just telling you all the truth is not pleasant. We grew up and growing up in East Wheeling, whites and blacks got along fine. But not so at Lindsley. I didn't go to anyone to ask or, or to say, I need tutoring. Because actually, I was afraid to go to anyone. I didn't feel welcome to go to anyone to ask for that. I didn't go to anyone and say, look, I have this problem adjusting uh, to a mindset where 
people are trying to figure me out. And I'm trying to figure them out. In other words, that or I don't feel welcome. I just met one of my classmates, someone I graduated with 50 years ago. This is my 50 year reunion this year. I just saw them yesterday and we embraced. I never knew that he felt about me the way that he did. By what he said, he's now a teacher at Lindsay. I never knew that he respected me. I never knew that he felt I was making it with class. He said, you did this with class. But that was all I had because I never wanted it to be said of me that I went to Lindsley, the first black face to enter that school and I didn't have class. Just because I was poor didn't mean I didn't have class. I just had good sound upbringing and I followed that upbringing. That's what it was about. So I persevered. I persevered at Lindsay. I knew that no one that I had seen in that school could play basketball with me. I'm, I'm not joking. No one could play basketball with me at Lindsay that I had seen back then because of who I was playing with every day. And they made me a, a better athlete. But remember, I had to ride public transit. So my freshman year, I had made them an offer they couldn't refuse to practice. Wasn't the tallest thing, but yes, I could jump through the roof and could shoot too. I could play the game. I'm going to start regardless what they say. You watch this. Well, I had to ride the bus to get to the game. The bus was late. I have no control over that. I arrived at the game just before um, uh, just before the team left to come out on the floor. Rushed and got in my uniform. Not only did I not start, even after I was asked, why are you late? And I explained what had happened. Not only did I not start, but coach didn't play me. And he didn't start me the rest of the year, uh, of the year of the season. And not only that, but I was lucky if I got in the game. I ran into what it, what legacy means. There were uh, other generations of previous graduates, white graduates of Lindsley, who owned the team. And they got first dibs on playing time. And that lasted all through my sophomore year, too. I watched as some rose to varsity, and I knew they shouldn't have been there. If I didn't have a varsity uniform, I knew they shouldn't have had one. And it, and, and it hurt. Some of you sitting in here knew how I could play basketball. That hurt. It hurt me my junior year. that I could barely get on the floor. My senior year, they needed me. So I started. It was, it was more than getting on the floor, but they didn't design any plays for me. The one best game that I had, absolutely, went off of 35 over against Bel Air St. John, and I was in my mind, I could see myself at the Nelson Jordan Center at the Elks Playground, and I was hot. When I get hot, I don't care who you put on me, I'm doing it. So I exploded for 35, and one, and, 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 and one shot I took, I was in my element, brought the ball down court, didn't pass it to anybody, they don't pass it to me. <laughs> Yeah. 
And I pulled up from where near where the three point line is in the NBA today and let it go. Because I knew it was going in. I'm, I was I was on. And Coach Howard, Steve, no. <laughs> and ball swish. He stuck his hands in his pockets, bowed his head, and just <laughs> That sounds, it, it's humorous, humorous. It sounds small, but it's not. It's not. Because that very same type of thing, and I, and, and I do tell you, again, they didn't run plays for me on the basketball court. They didn't do that. I have no idea what my stats are, were at Lindsay. But I had to graduate as one of their top rebounders. I know this. I know this. I couldn't tell you one stat. But after every game, they would run up to the white guys and go, hey, hey, you know, and this is my senior. Good game. Good y'all, man, you lit it up. If that's what's going on on a basketball court, and that's not, in my mind, all that serious playing basketball. Can you imagine what it was like for real? The atmosphere and the environment, being in a classroom. Now, it was not all bad. I met some good people at Lindsay, very good people at Lindsay. But I knew the whole time that I was going to leave there and not enjoy what so many others enjoyed. Most of you have had some kind of bond with your with at least one of your classmates or some of your classmates after you graduated. Some of you probably still have some type of bond with someone you graduated with. You still have that bond today. I have spent 50 years. I was told I was lost. My name was lost. My location was lost. All of that kind of thing. But as recently as three years ago, I had reached out to Lindsley because I had lost my class ring. And while some people think that's a small thing, for me it was huge to have my class ring because I graduated from Lindsley and I'm black. But the whole time was stayed on my mind, and I don't want to take up a lot of time. It, it, is, it is practically impossible to describe the whole thing. But let me say this. I kept in my mind that all I want to do is open this door. Because if I can open this door, we will have a chance to prove that we can do this too. We may be socially disadvantaged, but we can do this too. All you got to do is give us a chance. And so that's what I was fighting for, to maintain excellence, to succeed in spite of and despite of the racism that I was going through and experiencing so that. Would you all stand up again? Please. So there it is. There it is. Yesterday when I was at Lindsley, I was granted the opportunity to speak to a group of students in the auditorium. You know what they were doing? They were having a, an a, a African American history presentation. That's progress. That's progress. And so, and so, and so, I'm saying all this to say I believe that in spite of what I went through at Lindsay, and again, I didn't prepare a big paper. I told uh, Mr. Zimmerman and, and Lee and the rest of them. I said, well, uh, yesterday at lunch, they all went. I said, well, you know, you all are lucky because. I started to prepare a manuscript, a document, 
And those members of First Baptist Church of Lakeland are sitting online on Zoom right now saying, uh-oh. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> you know, but that I wanted to do this, not to come up, come out here and tell on Lindsley. Lindsley is a fine school. In fact, Lindsley is one of the probably one of the best schools in this country, without question. That's not why I wanted to come when I was asked. That's not, if, if you all came to hear me tell on Lindsley, I'm not doing that. I'm gonna still say the Lindsley Military Institute, the challenges, the negativity because of my race, and the positivity, where there were those few who supported me there at Lindsley, both with the staff and among my classmates, have helped to make me who I am today. And it is the best thing, one of the best things, after the Lord and my family, that has ever happened to me. So I thank you, Lindsley, for giving me the chance because I knew that if you did, I could do it. It would be tough, but I could do it. I learned how strong I could be by going through what I went through at Lindsley. And now I, I hear names like Willie Clay. Sorry. I hear names like C.J. Goodwin. I didn't even know till yesterday that C.J. Goodwin attended Lindsay. <laughs> I hear names like that. I hear names like Eddie Drummond, graduated from Lindsay. I see you sitting there, Brother Tyrell. I, I did not know. I did not know Jeff Potts. I did not know that Scott Thomas had at one time attended Lindsay. These are the folks who I wanted to open the door from. And I'm gonna ask Jeff, would you please stand all the current uh, uh, the current graduates of Lindsley are, who are here, would you please stand? This is why I did it. So I'm going to yield my time. I, I don't know what you all were expecting from my coming all the way from the D.C. metropolitan area to come up here and do this. But I do want you to know that for me, it has been cathartic. It has been healing that I needed it, and I needed to see the fruits of my labors. Thank you so very much, and thank you all for choosing me. Okay, everybody be seated. Uh, the rest of the program is to allow those 14, not everybody's present, one is actually deceased, his name is Carlton Lewis. Uh, his yeah. sister, Pamela Lewis, uh, was supposed to zoom in and speak on his behalf, but we're gonna go in order according to graduation date and age, of course. So Mr. Bill Gummer will be up next. Every speaker from here out will only be allotted five minutes just to <laughs> say what they need to say. Uh, after Mr. Gummer will be Dorian Lee, who was a Lindsley graduate in the first year of the prep school, but he went fifth through 12th grade. And he and Mr. Jeff Potts were the first to do the entire fifth through 12th grade. They were the first. So, without further ado, Mr. Bill Gunn. Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, Reverend Wright uh, did an excellent job in painting the picture of uh, society at that time and the, um, I was in Wheeling. But needless to say, we were both um, educated by the streets of East Wheeling yeah. and the neighborhoods of East Wheeling. Uh, my first 31 years were all within eight blocks of this building. So 
lived in uh, throughout East Wheeling. But I uh, graduated in 73 from, from Lindsley. And um, I was one of three in 1969 that uh, attended Lindsley. The other two were Carlton Lewis, who uh, was mentioned, who started as a seventh grader, and he graduated in 75. My cousin, Reverend Wayne Bird, and both of them who were no longer with us. You know, my opportunity is at Lindsley was made possible by a scholarship for my four years. Dr. Don Hofferider, who at the time was a new trustee on the board of directors at Lindsley. He was still active with Lindsley till his death uh, just a few months ago. My mother thought it was gonna be a great idea for several reasons, but her number one was because of the death of my father two years earlier. She thought the structure of Lindsley would be good for me. At the beginning, I felt that it was punishment. <laughs> I had to get up 90 minutes early, as Steve mentioned, to catch the bus to go to Lindsley because neither one of my parents ever drove. Also, was not keen on wearing a uniform and being inspected every day. Each morning, we'd gather uh, outside in the company formations unless it was raining, and then we'd be inside in the hallways it's raining. But always inspected head to toe. Were you clean shaven, uniform pressed, buckle clean, and shoes shined? And at the time, what seemed worse of all, I had to read a 300 plus page novel during the summer, which was the first full book that I'd ever read. You know, and Steve mentioned the, the economic differences and such, and, you know, that was uh, definitely an impactful part of what uh, learned. But the largest struggle I incurred was dealing with the advanced curriculum, the strict structure, as well as homework every night. You know, public school, we didn't have homework at night. And some of the textbooks that I used at Clay School in the eighth grade, they were using in sixth grade at Lindsley. But throughout, oddly enough, the middle ground that I found with my classmates was with sports. And really, it was the same middle ground that we found here in East Wheeling, whether it was Tunnel Green, Elks Playground, Laughlin Chapel or at school, you know, something to get together that you all had in common and games understanding this was all before any video games, <laughs> any cell phones, <laughs> but a, an opportunity to get together and talk the same language. So, you know, although, you know, being competitive the way we all are as human beings, we did uh, have our scuffles, arguments, and disagreements. But in the end, the coaches and teachers always brought us back to the common goal as teammates and fellow students. My biggest challenge happened on January 30th, 1970, just a few weeks into my second semester. My mother died suddenly of a heart attack. Needless to say, for a 14-year-old, it was a very traumatic time. At the time, I had no living brothers, sisters, or parents. Did have a couple of uncles, but they had large families too. So the solution to the dilemma that I had was that Lindsley allowed me access to the dorm program. And I became a dorm student for the rest of my freshman year. So a huge change for me, but now I was thrust fully into the environment of Lindsley. So the challenges I mentioned earlier continued, although for me, the solutions magnified. One of the subjects that I struggled with the most was Spanish. 
one of my fellow dorm students was from Mexico. So he helped me with my Spanish. I helped him with his English and knowledge of wheeling. What great that was. The large part of my transition academically was that now I not only had help by my teachers in school, but also had help in the evening with our mandatory study time in the dormitories. So that helped me get on the right track with solid study habits. Throughout the years at Lindsley, the curriculum and structure of Lindsley built into me self-respect, respect for others and their opinions, taking responsibility for your actions, development of listening skills, finding a middle ground with others, teamwork, and leadership. And I mention all of those because they had a huge impact on my life. And I'm gonna go into some of that and, and you'll soon uh, understand what I'm talking about here. My senior year, along with the scholarship offers I received, I also received a commendation to attend the Air Force Academy as well which I was very fortunate, felt very fortunate to receive and was ready to go. Unfortunately, after uh, doing my physical, uh, I got received a letter in late June saying that they didn't think I could handle the activity of the Air Force Academy. And that reference was to a uh, guy hit by a car when I was 10 years old and had a compound fracture of my leg. So with that coming in late June, didn't have an opportunity to take advantage of the offers, other offers that I have. So I ended up uh, attending West Virginia Career College. Those of you who remember it, attended that for two years and received an associate degree in accounting. As I was getting that degree, degree I worked at a clothing store and two years part-time with UPS, loading and unloading trailers and delivery vehicles, and had an opportunity to become a delivery driver. During my years as a, a driver, I had many conversations with my managers and HR people about wanting to go into management. And in every conversation, they wanted to make sure that I understood that with only having an associate's degree, I would never be more than a supervisor. After six years of being a driver, I did decide to go into uh, management. I was promoted to a supervisor to train delivery drivers. Day one, my family and I were transferred to Charleston, West Virginia. I spent 24 years with UPS management. My family moved five times and all but one was to a different state. During that time, I had 15 different assignments, worked in 41 of the 50 states, and promoted numerous times. Before I retired, I had held for seven years the position of Corporate Vice President of Transportation, responsible for 82,000 people, sorting over 24 million in packages with the tractor trailer operations and the 100 plus sorting operations around the country. And I'll tell you that, that because the many different roles with UPS all require the leadership and people skills that I learned at Lindsley. You know, but I'll be the first to admit, it took me quite a few years to develop and understand and use them properly but the benefit of it was immense. And of course, you never realize when you're learning what it's all about. But it came to the point that UPS realized that my continued success in leading different groups of people towards service, quality, cost, and safety goals was more important than a degree that stated that I passed the courses. 
I want to make sure you understand, I'm not trying to downplay the importance of a college education or a degree. I'm just commenting on my experience at a time that corporations were demanding degrees, what the foundation of a Lindsley education did for me. Albert Einstein said, and I quote, Education is not the learning of facts, but the training of the mind to think. And that's the one thing that Lindsley always has tried to do, to get out, get people out of their comfort zone, to make them think to make them do things that they wouldn't ordinarily do, to make them be around people that they wouldn't ordinarily be around. Reverend Wright talked about the different struggles and issues and concerns that uh, went through. Were they tough at that time? Yes. Were they educational? Yeah. Absolutely. You know, it's just like uh, I talked to my uh, sons about different things and they comment and and grandchildren too, how much they dislike their boss. I said, well, I haven't heard too many people that love their boss. <laughs> but we all need a job. We all need to work. I had uh, at least 15 different assignments. I had two that I respected. <laughs> but even in those situations, you learn that how you felt about them and made you question, how do they feel about you when you're uh, leading these people? But a few years after I retired, my wife, Danae, and I returned to the Ohio Valley to be closer to our six grandchildren. But along with getting closer uh, to family, it also allowed me to get closer to the school that expanded my horizons and made my success possible. I had stayed somewhat in touch with Lindsley uh, throughout most of the 26 years away from the Ohio Valley. And I attended a few reunions, but uh, you know, at times I was even out on the West Coast uh, for a few years. But four years ago, I was given the opportunity to join Lindsley's Board of Trustees. And in these years, I've gotten to see up close the impact and the challenges that Lindsley continues to have in the Ohio Valley. In an effort to support Lindsley and the students, my wife, Denise, and I have decided we wanted to establish a scholarship. The Gummer Scholarship is for a student from the Ohio Valley to attend the upper school. They will receive a scholarship for each of their four years of high school. There are requirements such as community service, letters of recommendation, and GPA, but the decision for the scholarship award is based on need. You know, Dr. Hoffreiter provided the scholarship money for me to get a world-class education. I want to show my gratitude for what Lindsley has meant to me and my family by helping others to receive the benefit of attending Lindsley. As we speak, the young lady who was the first recipient of the Gummer Scholarship has graduated from Lindsley and is successful in the first year of college. The second recipient is in her first year at Lindsley, currently a freshman, has transitioned well and doing very well in the classroom. Our goal is to reward a deserving student every year with a four-year scholarship. The first two Gummer scholarship winners are both African-American students, although that is not the criteria of the scholarship selection process. You know, to date, there's been 149 black graduates from Lindsley. Currently, there are 19 enrolled. 2017 was the largest graduating class, which had 12. You know, so many parents these days spoil their children in so many ways. 
and they comment that they do so because they want them to have it better than they had it. Anybody have that conversation? Okay. They say they can't afford to send their children to Lindsley. And my thought is how can you not afford to send your child to Lindsley if you want them to have a quality education? As with most things in life, you don't really know the significance of it until many years later. But mom knew best when she sent me to Lindsley. You know, and I just want to comment to the, the students and it's a very pleasant surprise, Mr. Zimmerman, having the uh, students here and uh, very thoughtful of you and very impactful. But in life, there are definitely uh, struggles, trials that we all go through. And hopefully we learn to get through those and help each other to get those as Reverend Wright did for, for me. As I didn't do as well for, no, for Potts. These are, I was a senior, he was a fifth grader. You know, you don't realize just how impactful you can be to that next one down. We've got to continue to help each other get through the process and learn. And that's what, let's part, call that part of teamwork. It's not an official basketball team or football team, but it's fellow students. We need to continue to help to work through each other. But for me, as you can see, Lindsley was a big part of my life. Lindsley was a big part of my, not only education, but understanding of life and helping me to get through my rough times in which I'm very, very thankful that I had Lindsley in my life. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Okay, because Mr. Gummer and Mr. Wright are the original OGs, he got a little bit more time than everybody else. That's what I'm <laughs> On that note, five minutes. Five. I will interrupt you going forward. So next, so next, Carlton Lewis, who graduated in 1975, who is deceased, he followed Bill Gummer. His sister, Pamela Lewis, has joined us via Zoom, and she is going to speak on his behalf. Five minutes, Pam. I'll say good afternoon. It's still morning in Sacramento, California. Carlton was my PIC. Stephen knows that. Hi, Stephen Wright, my partner in crime. And I look forward for the day that Carlton and I would be attending Willie High School together. But my dad, Reverend Wright, and a few other people said, no, that wasn't going to happen. Carlton was going to attend Lindsley Military Institute. And today, Carlton is not here with us. But I know if he was, he would have a story to tell of what he faced when he started. But thanks to Stephen and Bill Governor, we call him lovingly Courtney Governor, Carlton made it have a little easier going in. We were born up in a time when racism was prevalent. We were born up in a time when you could go certain places in the world and still see the word cold and white. Mm -hmm. But to attend this the military institute was a milestone in these young men's lives. Because if anybody knew the family that 
I was a member of. They knew our dad did not pray. And he would tell you, you have that bone. You, your last name was Lewis, you have that bone. And I saw, I would see my brother get up early in the morning. He too would take public transportation to live me. But he persevered and made it through. And to those I understand, now it's co-ed. To, to you students that are going to live me now and those that graduated from the co-ed school that it is, you have Stephen Wright, William Gummer, Carlton Lewis, and a few others to thank because they walked those halls. The walk in those halls wasn't easy. And to Stephen and William Courtney Gummer, I just want to say thank you again for paving the way for my little brother, Carlton William Lewis, Weston Abbey Carlton. Thank you very much. Again, thank you for joining us all the way from Sacramento, California, Pamela. I appreciate it. Okay, next, Roderick White graduated from Lindsley in 1977. Uh, he's not with us today. Uh, we made several attempts to reach out to him, but he was originally from Columbus, Ohio. Okay, we're moving on. Next is Dorian Lee from Steubenville, Ohio. He currently lives in Bowling Green, Kentucky. And one thing I'd like to note, on Wikipedia, it references notable graduates from Lindsley, and some of them were already mentioned, and a, and a lot of them were guys that played in the NFL. But the distinction that Dorian holds is he is the first black graduate from Lindsley that went to an HBCU on a full scholarship and graduated and played all four years football at Tennessee State. Dorian, you're up next. <laughs> Scott, Scott's older brothers, Sean was in my class, and we were all close. But Bill and Reverend Lewis, thank you. Bill, you might not think you helped us, but you helped us a lot. You were who I looked up to. Reverend Wright. I just knew your picture. I never did meet you. And unfortunately, I didn't get in the Zoom all the time to see everything. But thank you very much. In 1972, in the fall, I didn't want to go to this. I was made to go to this. <laughs> my older brother didn't threaten to go to this by my father because he was a disciplined man and we liked to fool around in school. So, I came to Lindsley, but it was funny that it wasn't to me about the color of people's skin because I grew up in Steubenville and went to Catholic schools. And the only other black faces at those schools were either that of my brother or my sister. So when I saw Jeff Potts and Lamont Oliver and Roger White, I thought, damn, there's some people here like me. When I got to talk, they got to the got to the school when Bill Gunn was playing football, and you had to understand I was a football fanatic. I thought that's my man right there. So uh, Lindsley, now it was different for us because I lived in Steubenville and I had to go home every weekend. So I led a, a twofold life. Monday through Friday, I lived the majority of my life. When I got to school in the middle, I was back with the brothers. <laughs> now, I was, but it was good for me. Uh, I didn't delve, you know, I understood our buddies and we were all friends, but the guys just always asked me, why don't you come to the dances? Why don't you stick around? I didn't want to. Times were different for me. I graduated in 80, but I feel it was old enough to know that there was still separation of things. As far as Lindsay goes, it was a good school for me. It taught me discipline. One of the things that I learned when I got to Tennessee State, I took a, uh, I had to take a, a, a class and they gave you these tests and it was an English class. 
my English professor came back and she said, do you realize that you have graded out well enough to teach in the state of Tennessee and you are a freshman, a first semester freshman at Tennessee State University? That told me right there the things that I had learned in Lindsley were going to help me through college. My young brother came to Lindsley also. And between him, Jeff, Scott, Lamar, Sean, I kind of looked down and tried to make sure that each one of them had somebody to do something with or be their protector if need be. So Lindsley taught me a lot. Jeff and I got to march in the inauguration parade in 1976. We were on the front page of the Wheeling Pets. We had some good leaders, but I think the one thing that we had is that we had each other. And I hope that we pass that on to these young folks that are there now. Now, I'm like everybody else. I would like to see Lindsay have. I, I went to a Lindsay football game, I'll go back this fall for the first time. In 40 years, I just never had the opportunity to get back or stay, stay busy. When I looked out there, I thought things have changed, but they haven't changed enough. And I would hope that the school would reach out to some of the, there's other kids in Studentville, and there's people in Wheeling, and to have that diversity that, that, that this school needs so that it can be even better than it is. But I have a lot of props for Lindsley and Scott. You might be a good minister, and I'm going to be a good sheep, but I'm going to make sure I keep this other five. <laughs> so I just want everybody to know I appreciate what I went through with Lindsley. I appreciate the education I got at Lindsley. And I appreciate the people that I met and who helped me. And we had professors, we had Coach Hawkins, Dr. Hoffrider. Those folks, they kind of specialized because they knew we were doing something different. And at the time, they were brown, brown brown. So like I said, I'm going to keep it to my five minutes. Scott, thank you. And I appreciate what you did to get this together. No doubt, no doubt. I appreciate everybody's patience. Please stay, there's much more. Next on the mic is one of my other big brothers, Jeff Potts. And he graduated in 1980 with Dorian and my older brother, Sean Thomas, who's no longer with us. Jeff? Hey, good afternoon, everyone. I will, trust me. <laughs> you will learn never to put a mic in front of a preacher. <laughs> Don't give me a pine. No, no, I'll be here today. Um, Struggled with what to talk about. Um, I'm just going to keep it as short as possible. We used to refer to uh, Dr. Wright as the picture on the wall. He, that we didn't know him. I just know that in June he graduated, and in September six of us showed up in the dorm. Um, I'm sorry, five of us was in the dorm. Yeah, five of us were in the dorm. We had no idea that we were breaking ground. We just wanted to go to school. Myself, um, my situation was different because I came from Columbus. So my travels were further. I couldn't go home on the weekends. Lensley was a culture shock. My Lord, I could spend hours talking about that. But nevertheless, we were able to overcome because we got to meet a variety of students. Um, we I, There were many firsts that we endeared and endeavored to keep, I didn't really want to stay this long to stand up here in front, but just to say thanks. We called Bill, still Bill. He was the quiet storm. He was the person, even after I grad he graduated, I was able to reach out to at least once or twice to have a conversation to calm myself because of what I was in. Not understanding that I had to go through that to get to something, okay? A lot of times we don't understand you go through some things to get to some things. Yeah. Students in the back, I almost cried seeing that many people here. That's powerful. I love that. So it means that my labor was not in vain. I want you to know that I love each and every one of you. I love the school. I know Dr. Uh, Mr. Diorio probably 
did not care for me too much because his first year was my last. So to know that I had a little bit of uh, arrogance was probably an understatement because I felt that I had paid my dues. Okay. But at the end of things and because of things that we endeared, we got this today. It's, 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 it's empowering to know that there's 150, approximately 150 that have graduated. It's fantastic to know that so many others have left that we had a graduating class of what, 12 did you say? Or That's powerful to go to a school because I came from a predominantly African-American neighborhood. You know, I wasn't afforded the opportunities of many people. I, my first four years, my parents gave up their retirement to pay for me to go to Lindsley. I didn't know that out, find that out until my mother passed away. Two years ago, I was able to go back so it's with pride that I stand before you today. It's an emotional piece for me. Yeah. Because I stand for my parents, too, who gave up a lot for me to come here. Now, I, I was able to receive a partial scholarship. I wanted to leave Lindsley as an eighth grader. And I'll tell this story real briefly. I had a chance to go to a parochial school um, in Columbus, Ohio. Worked this summer. Went into the library two weeks before school started. They gave me my class books. I told myself, well, whoa, 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 whoa. Fellas, I already got these at home. They didn't believe me. I had to bring my Latin book that I had taken in sixth grade at Lindsay. Was freshman Latin at the parochial school in Columbus. My, my psychology class was a freshman course that we had taken at Lindsay, I think in ninth or 10th grade. It, it was incredible that all, they, they couldn't believe that I had the books. They didn't even believe they were mine until they opened them up and saw that they were, my name was on They kept saying, man, you, you weren't playing. You know you can test out and be a sophomore. I said, nah, it's okay. And the, only, the other person that I'd like to acknowledge is Skip Prosser. Skip Prosser was the reason that I came back, the late Skip Prosser, George Skip Prosser. He called me every day for two weeks, Patsy, I need you. I said, but Skip, you want me to play, let me play varsity as a freshman? He said, well, we got a great freshman program. And I said, but Skip, I I want, I want a hoop. <laughs> hoop was my thing. Hoop was my girlfriend. The other game, the other sports that I played were just somebody to kick it with until hoop season started. But I thank you for the opportunity to stand before you. Um, the question that I have for everybody today is what do we want to look like in the future? What do we want this to look like? What are we going to do to make it happen? What are we willing to invest? Um, a lot of people don't know the graduates have all stuck together. For the most part, I reached out to Roger Glad and I haven't heard from him. Uh, Michael and I, Dorian and I talk constantly. I go to see Dorian. Eddie and Eddie and I live in the same city. We, we, we reach out. Dr. Wright and I now have at least a conversation once every two weeks. Most of the time it's about the Lord because that's who we are. It's not Leslie was just got me to that place. There were many stories. If I had longer to go into it, I could. Because there were things that I experienced that Lindsay prepared me for ministry. And so I thank God for Lindsay. I do. I thank God for that opportunity. I thank God for not allowing me to go through some of the stuff that some of these other brothers had to go through because I was at Lindsay. And it prepared me for what it is that I am today. So I thank you. That's all I got. I'm going to sit down. I want to be a. Uh, the next graduate will be my brother, older brother, he's now deceased, Sean Thomas. And I'm just going to say two words on his behalf. Lindsley students, you won't understand it, but the people of the Wheeling community will, Ann and Clyde. Yeah. Next would be Michael Lee, Dorian Lee's little brother. He was a year ahead of me at Lindsley. And Michael gave me a piece to read on his behalf. Michael T. Lee's Lindsley experience. I'm proud and honored to be a graduate of Lindsley, along with cherished memories of my Lindsley experience. My Lindsley education has served me well uh, during my life's journey, and I find myself falling back on learned lessons from my eight years at Lindsley. I find it an honor and very humbling to be among some of the first at Lindsley. I do have one memory of Lindsley that stuck with me through, uh, through the years that I've uh, done a lot of reflecting on. 
I overheard a conversation that a history teacher was having with another faculty member and the comment was made, I am not going to teach black history because their history is the same as American history. The comment did not sit well with me then and now. It has taken me years to figure out why the statement did not sit well with me. The statement is true and false at the same time. Mm -hmm. I'm assuming the teacher was making a true statement and that he was teaching history to the best of his knowledge. The reason for mentioning the story, the only black history that I was taught while attending Lindsley was about the Civil War. My point, in my opinion, the purpose of Black History Month is to highlight black achievements in society. So black history is inclusive with American history. My hope for Lindsley moving forward is to hire the first black faculty member along with other minorities so students and faculty are more rounded because of diversity. It is very powerful and beneficial for students to see themselves in faculty, not just with their peers, that reflects in American society. In closing, my Lindsley experience left me with very fond memories and a solid foundation which to have led my life. Michael Lee. Next would be me. <laughs> I don't know if I'm going to be able to. <sighs> As I stated, Anna and Clyde, <sighs> unlike Reverend Wright, Mr. Gummer, I didn't grow up in East Wheeling. I grew up in North Park. I grew up in what will be part of the States. So I had to deal with two different dynamics. I had to deal, well, I went to Country Day out of kindergarten through fourth grade. And my brother started out of Clay School, and he too got a partial scholarship to come to Lindsley when I think he was uh, eighth grade. That particular year, my mom said, we're going to send you to Madison. And the reason she said that is because she said she wanted me to be around peers of all backgrounds, not just the rich white kids that I grew up with when I went to Wheeling Country Day. And I'm not saying that that was a bad experience because at that young of age, I didn't look at it in that manner. I didn't even think about it. I was going to school and these were my friends. But the dynamic was my grandparents lived in East Wheeling, the late uh, Laura and uh, Wade Augbright. So I did have that connection with the black community and the kids of my age group in summer league basketball, baseball, the whole nine, or even just going to visit Harry Redman or Jiggles Gordon, kids like that that went, ended up going to Wheeling Park. So that other dynamic, when I did get to Lindsley, and I was, driven to Lindsley, I didn't have to take the bus. Um, <laughs> when my brother graduated, my parents let me know that they couldn't afford to continue to send me to Lindsley. So they said, do you want to go to Central? And I thought about it, but all of my friends growing up were like from Woodsdale, Fulton. And so I said, no, nah, I'll go to Wheeling Park, and uh, which I did. So when I got to Wheeling Park, I had to deal with the dynamic of the Uncle Tom bullshit. Yeah. <laughs> Where my parents did what they did to provide me a better education yeah. and hopefully a better life. Man, and uh, I got through it because I was a Thomas and I'm an alpha male and I was competitive in sports and sports is what got me my respect from the black community. I'm not saying I was an all-star, but them same brothers that was coming at me that way my sophomore year part, you know, I had to sit out because I transferred from Lindsley from freshman going to my sophomore year, but I was practicing and taking brothers to the hole or doing whatever and played football. But the main point is I got my respect through sports for some reason. And over the years, sports, music, and war break down all barriers because you have to come together for a common cause. And that eliminates all that other bullshit. Yeah. 
And so I'm a 23 year Air Force veteran and my dynamic did a complete 360 where I grew up with mostly white friends. But when I went into the military, I came in contact with more black people and gravitated towards black culture. So as a grown man, majority of my friends today are black day to day. I still have my friends from when I grew up, from Wheeling, my white friends and my black friends. And the funny thing I wanna share real quick is when I retired uh, after 23 years and I had my retirement ceremony, my four best uh, white friends were sitting in the front row and all my black military friends were looking at me sideways like, yo, what's up with this? <laughs> you know, but they all knew my upbringing. They would clown, you know, they got black people in West Virginia. And I'm like, yeah, you know, <laughs> you play golf growing up, you know, stuff like that. But uh, no, my Lindsley experience was cool. I had cover with Jeff Potts, Dorian Lee and my brother. So I never had to worry about any type of racism on any level. I could handle the cats and migrate at my level. There's a few knuckleheads in between, but they knew if they messed with me, they had to answer to my big brother. So they they paved the way for me. And uh, Lindsley was a great experience. When I did go to Wheeling Park my sophomore year, I'm taking a chemistry class with seniors. That was the difference in the educational gap that proved to me, you know, going to Wheeling Country Day, one year at Madison, and then Lindsley, uh, Lindsley proved to be a great experience. And we had two summer reading books, and we got tested on them the first week we got back. So, <laughs> so yeah, and then uh, I was the only kid, only black kid in my class, first through fourth grade at Wheeling Country Day. Went to uh, Madison, that was a different dynamic. And then from sixth to eighth grade, I was the only black kid in my class. And lo and behold, the next speaker and next Lindsley graduate, Eddie Tyree came. And uh, yeah, we bonded and there you go. Eddie, you're next. <laughs> physical therapy. Scott, I'll put, I, I put my phone up here so I can put on five minutes for sure. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Good Thank you for allowing me to be here. Um, Lindsley was a lesser of three evils for me. And uh, I say that because um, I'm going to be too truthful. I was bad. I was very bad. <laughs> and I come from a pretty prominent family in Columbus, Ohio. My uh, uncle was a uh, right-hand man to the mayor. And my dad was a minister of one of the largest minority churches in Columbus. And I was bad enough that I was starting to be a problem to their name. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that uh, summer, I had a choice between how military school which is in Indiana, Culver Military School, which is in Indiana, and Lindsley, which is obviously here in Wheeling. Well, you know me, I'm gonna choose the closest one to home because I figure I can get back to my friends quicker and you know, still be a problem. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, Lindsley came about because of Jeff Potts. Jeff Potts' mom, um, great lady, was very close with my, with my mother. And uh, she told her all about Lindsley and, and that's how I got down here. Um, I'm gonna be honest, I never, never didn't have any Caucasian friends growing up at all. Saw so them at school, you know, but there was that class and I'm with my friends here. Lindsay gave me an opportunity to, to meet new friends. And I, to the point where now, I don't have Caucasian friends or black friends, I just have friends. I have friends. And, and it's, it, it's shocking to my friends back at home that I'm able to deal with any and everyone because I learned that aspect by being at Lindsley. Now, I'm, my classmates back there, students, I wasn't the brightest student. Mr. Rick, Mr. Uh, Iori will tell you, hey, I struggled. I struggled in school. But what it did teach me is that, like Jeff said, you can struggle and still make it through. And uh, my struggle at school taught me that when I got into the real world, that I would still be able to make it through, even if I have struggles to the point now I've been a legal assistant 
at an attorney's office for the last 25 years and uh, have done well, helped form some cases that we have won. And, uh, you know, as a legal assistant, you do all the work and they get all the glory. <laughs> but I, I didn't, Mr. Dewar, tell you, I really like school all that much. So I wasn't trying to go to law school and, and doing those different things. But Lindsley was, uh, I love it to this day. Uh, and I, I appreciate the path that you set forth and the path that Jeff and Dorian and Mike and Scott have set forth and Mr. And Mr. Dummer has set forth for us. We're here for Black History Month. And if you break down the word history, it means it's his story. What is, your, what is going to be your story in the back? What is going to be your story? And I mean, ladies, I may say his, but it's also yours as well. What is going to be your story? You tell the story going forward. And I appreciate you guys. That face I see back there, I appreciate. Because when I graduated, I was the only one. I bridged the gap between the Lindsley military. I came in the last year of the military and I went into the next year to the prep school. So what is your what is your story going to be from this point on? Thank you for your time. Yeah. Okay, everybody, we got through it. All right. So I want to thank everybody that came out and attended. I uh, thank Leslie for bringing out the students. I thank Sean Duffy and his staff for uh, allowing me to use this place. I thank our people that chimed in with technology Zoom. So everybody have a great afternoon, and uh, thank you for your attendance. Thank <laughs> you.